Hi all, I'd like to show you an absolutely fantastic game this afternoon. It was from the Fisher against Petrosian Candidates match in Buenos Aires 1971, so that's in Argentina. Fisher had prior to this game 20 consecutive victories. This is a modern record, I think still held. Some commentators give it as 19, apparently not counting Fisher's game against Oscar Pano, which was a default. He resigned after Fisher's first move as a protest. Fisher won his last seven games at the 1970 Palma de Mallorca Interzonal, uh, including that default. In the quarterfinals leading up to uh, this match, Fisher swept aside Mark Timonov 6 0, and in the semi finals, Fisher swept aside Bent Larson by the same score 6 0. So 20 consecutive victories. So, what was Tigran Petrosian going to do? Tigran Petrosian is a very, very strong player. He was nicknamed Iron Tigran due to his almost impenetrable defensive playing style, which emphasised safety above all else. He was a candidate for the World Championship on eight occasions, including this one. So was he going to beat Fischer to be able to play Boris Spassky? So he was a challenger in 1953, 56, 59, 62, 71, which is this one, 1974, 1977, 1980. He won the World Championship in 1963 against Mikhail Botvinnik. He defended it in 1960 against Spassky, and he lost it in 69 to Spassky. OK, let's get on to the game. D4 from Tigran. And Fischer played knight f6. And after c4, Fischer played g6. So the question still is open if, if Fischer's going to play either a King's Engine defence or a Groomfield defence. Now, the King's Engine defence would be bishop g7 here, but now actually d5 was played. The Groomfield defence, which uh, was used for Fischer's game of the century when he was 16 years old, Groomfield, which he's played a lot, heavily versed in. Now, Petrosian elects for bishop f4, a solid continuation after bishop g7, e3. And now we see c5. And the most common move here now is d takes c5. That was played. Queen a5. And black is preparing to get back the pawn at some point, but knight e4 is an important threat to consider here. Rook c1 in advance of knight e4 means now that after knight e4 there's a cute little tactic already in this game that white doesn't have to be concerned about the c3 knight as you'd expect, as you might expect. Let's put on a bit to here. A clever move, but theory. It's played c takes d5. And you might think, well, isn't this really bad because of knight takes c3 and then check. The thing is, after knight takes c3, there isn't needed. Uh, it's very bad to play b takes c here. Instead, white now plays queen d2. The knight is pinned to the queen. It's a theory. Black now plays queen takes a2. There isn't anything much better than that. After b takes c3, queen a5. So white seems to have more pawns in the center here, but c5 is loose. Black's potentially got a past a pawn, which in some games in the group has been uh, used to win games later. But for the moment, there's a lot of plan of position. And white now elects for bishop c4. Now, taking on c5 with the queen might not be an ideal <coughs> blockader in this position. And I think this is the theory move. Knight d7 is the most popular theory move. To play knight d7 with the option of knight takes c5. And then later, for example, bishop d7, black castling queenside, it's not such uh, a bad game for black at all. It's quite respectable. Now here is the first interesting, very interesting move from Tigran Petrosian, knight e2. And you might think, well, isn't this in theory, it's knight f3. Both knight e2 and knight f3 are controlling d4, but knight f3 is controlling e5 square. Is that a little bit of provocation, as though it's got a weakness of the last move, it's not covering e5? Does this knight routinely have to take on c5? Now this is a big question which must have gone through Fisher's mind. Is there some problem with knight e2? Because otherwise, isn't it getting away, letting white get away with some sort of position or concession if knight g3 is quite comfortably on e4? That might be dangerous for breaking any blockades. 
later, you know, if this C pawn moves, this knight g3 to e4. So perhaps Fisher was wondering about this. And we see now, instead of the more routine knight takes c5, we see knight e5. And I guess uh, Fisher might not be expecting here a bishop takes e5, giving up voluntarily uh, the bishop pair. But the situation is is very unbalanced here structurally, very unbalanced pawn structure. That white has greater central pawns, and this knight has got potentially a comfort square on d4 if it wasn't for this pesky knight. So it occurred to Tigran to actually consider um, moving the bishop first, but with the option of taking on e5 had to be considered here as well. If the bishop had taken here, it's not so bad for white this position after knight d4. But uh, after queen takes c5, you know, black's still doing uh, okay, even with bishop b5 check, king f8, black's actually okay here. So we actually get uh, this suspended, this idea of bishop takes e5, but one has to be aware of it. It is possible to see what benefits. Uh, can be gained from that. The bishop just dropped back for a moment. And I think this next move might be a little bit on the dodgy side. The knight now seems to justify some sort of action on d3, as though black can get a bit more development in for free, maybe, and force white to do something, um, uh, some sort of concession. So we actually, in the game, uh, see the move Bishop f5, eyeing that d3, it seems to threaten you know, to win the exchange. Uh, instead, if queen takes c5, and this this kind of situation, it seems this is okay, even with this knight g3 uh, cheeky maneuver now that knight e2 afforded, it seems uh, white's advantage is not too significant, even if the, the c5 queen can be harassed. This is okay for black as well. So if we go back to this move, bishop f5, bishop a2, bishop f5, seems to be celebrating this knight on e5. But maybe it's a little bit optimistic, because now this makes it a little bit more effective than before, as we'd witnessed, for, to, for playing bishop takes e5. This forcing move has got a strategic significance. Now, a greater strategic significance is backed up uh, more tactically here. After bishop takes e5, knight d4 carries with it, of course, uh, some menacing threats like knight takes f5 in particular, which didn't exist before in that other variation. And if the bishop drops back here, well, if the bishop drops back, let's look at various alternatives. First of all, if the bishop takes, that improves white's massive pawns in the center. That's very advantageous for white positionally. If the bishop drop back here, then white's still doing very nicely here with tempo f4, bishop c7, c6. It's just justifying the knight on d4 here. This is a very, very pleasant position for white as well. So this this is very, very annoying, this position after knight d4. Our bishop doesn't really want to go back to c8, because then c6, and this starts to look a bit miserable after c4, attacking the queen. Black's on the back foot here for c5. It's starting to look a bit nasty as well, an advantage for white. So this knight d4 is already causing some issues now. White has a significant edge here. The opening has gone a little bit wrong for Fisher, one could argue here. Various alternatives don't seem to do much. Castling, you know, accepting double pawns might seem quite dynamic. And there might be a very dynamic justification here that black can avoid any problems of getting potentially mated on this diagonal. For example, like this, castles, queen takes c5, queen c2, queen c8. This kind of position, which Fisher might have envisaged on castling, looks almost to be getting the black king mated after f4, bishop g7. And if we look at uh, moves like c4, white has various threats like rook f3 and maybe coming in like this. And it's very dangerous, but black has resources like a5, which let the rook switch in for the fence. And this, from an engine point of view, might not be entirely 
the end of black here. Black might not be getting terminated so easily this kind of position, although it does seem to be unpleasant. Opposite coloured bishops often favour the, the, the player with the attack in this kind of position. It is significantly better for white. White does, though, still have also the f5 to attack. This inhibition of e6 with this bishop here means that rook h5 is more than more effective than usual to attack f5 without any e6 resource. So white would still be better, and maybe this is the sort of thing which really frightened Fisher, even if he had seen this a5 and rook a6 defensive idea. So Fisher in this position accepts a compromise to his structure. Queen takes c5, and then we have the horrendous looking knight takes f5, doubling black's pawns. And worse than that, with this pawn on d5 reinforced by this bishop, e6 is discouraged, of course. White has this as a sitting duck target. He just castles for the moment, not really worried about the g-file, really needs a lot more pressure to exploit the g-file. Queen a5 is played. And here we see queen c2 attacking f5, with e6 very difficult to play. Fisher just plays f4. Of course, he's weakening uh, some light squares. And here we see uh, a wonderful idea of playing on both sides of the board, potentially, the move c4. And wouldn't it be nice to have both these pawns side by side? As my good friend uh, Costas Karianis uh, did a video on this channel about the power of the two bishops, he mentions a very important concept. If we, if we take the idea that pawns are the soul of chess, two pawns side by side are like soulmates. Is it worth giving a pawn, giving up a pawn dynamically to get these soulmates together? Well, here the question now does arise because Fisher plays f takes e3. So would you consider, what would you consider here, just taking on e3 or playing c5? If I give you just a moment to reflect on that. So for the moment, white is a pawn down. Does he want to automatically recapture on e3? Well, we're humans. We like to have our pawns together. We like to have the dynamism of past pawns. And this is a very soulful move, putting the pawn soulmates together, c5. And there's no blockade on c5 now. And there's lasting pressure down the f file in any case. What can actually black do here? It's a very difficult position. If we look at a, maybe some alternatives here, casting, I would say, is completely out of the question. It seems just far too dangerous just to let white take the pawn back. And now threats include bishop b1, just striking h7 immediately. And this kind of position is just looking extremely dodgy for black. White is significantly better here. Uh, so. Basically, this is a very, very difficult position now. Uh, Fisher played actually queen d2. Another possibility, let's have a quick look, another possibility here. e takes f2, and you might think rook takes f2. No, rook takes f2, uh-oh, fells to bishop d4. No, that's not a good idea. But queen takes f2 might be reasonable, uh, encouraging f6. And this is a nice position for white as well after d6. It's a very uh, promising position indeed. That was an alternative, but even stronger, the strongest move uh, in this position, I believe, if this had been played, would have been king h1, just with the option of rook takes f2 without bishop d4. And for example, like this, attacking h7 now, and f5 now a target. And this is very, very difficult, uh, this position for black. White can just bully that f5 pawn like this, and it's a big advantage for white. So in this difficult position after c5, with the soulmates together, Fisher played queen d2, queen d2, pardon me, and now we have queen a4 check, emphasizing the king still in the center, kicking it to f8. And now a wonderful idea indeed it seems potentially, you know, this bishop is eyeing h2. I know black hasn't got his rooks connected or anything. It looks as though black, in principle, shouldn't be doing anything that active. And Petrosian, aware of this, for the moment, also um, 
he wants to maybe further his pawns and open up these diagonal this diagonal in particular to f7 here leaving the bishop useful by default on a2 he plays rook cd1 perhaps the idea of d6 and then attacking f7 and the queen can form the battery there so that's um, on the cards but now fisher plays queen e2 and now d6 so striking f7 white's now threatening all sorts of things but Fisher in this position has a very forcing move which must have been seen by Tigran. It's a little combination but black is on the back foot with his rooks not connected. Should one pl be playing actively like this? Queen h5, it does threaten mate on the spot. And there is a way of defending it but it does lose the exchange because black has not only just got this threat on h2, uh, black's also threatening e2 forking both rooks. So has this been a mistake here? Although the mate can be parried, and it is, f4 is played. But now e2, so winning an exchange. Is this all a calculated exchange sacrifice from Tigran Petrosian? Well, this bishop is a wonderful bishop on this diagonal. Fisher uh, lets... Um, goes for this exchange sacrifice after f takes e5 he doesn't want to play e takes because that automatically puts the rook against f7 so he plays e takes d1 here not e takes f1 we see rook takes d1 but the e5 pawn is dropping is this enough the queen bishop and rook here queen takes e5 and c5 is attacked Tigran doesn't bother with c5 he carries on for the attack now with rook f1 provoking a major weakness what can actually black do here if he tries to shield f7 like this queen d7 is a huge move in this position what does black actually do in this position if f5 surely we can just play all sorts of things this is just mating winning the queen this this position so that shows that the, the black king safety is really quite suspect here fisher doesn't bother taking on c5 he tries to do something about his king safety with f6 here and now queen d7 might be quite futile the queen is protecting e7 uh, a very accurate move is played indeed perhaps even more accurate it seems this diagonal in general in the general sense is very dangerous from both b3 and c4 the engines are suggesting tigran petrosian's queen b3 is more accurate much more accurate it seems than queen c4 let's just quickly explore that possibility queen c4 there will be e6 here. I think this is the idea that some defensive measure measures can be put up in this position. But this is more of a double attack move, queen b3. So threatening mate and also b7. So e6 here doesn't really help at all. It's much more effective than queen c4 because here we have queen takes b7, threatening this horrible queen e7 check. And in this position, if rook e8 then now in here this is very very dangerous for c6 the queen is overloaded can't protect f6 here if, it, if she takes on d6 rook takes f6 is mating so this this queen b3 is is a very very precise uh move indeed if we just go back this position is absolutely crushing the black queen is just totally overloaded if h5 for example c7 rook h7 trying to do something about that but c8 is just winning a rook so let's go back here queen b3 is a really knockout punch uh killing move in this position it seems attacking both b7 and f7 fisher tries king g7 and now this allows queen f7 check king h6 and now this pawn structure is destroyed with d takes e7 now threatening rook takes f6 that stopped for a little moment f5 but now the last bit of cleverness here the back row is not really an issue for white white plays rook takes f5 any check here is is a bit futile fisher tries queen d4 check and the king just drops to h1 there's a huge threat of rook h5 mate in this position and Fisher resigns here if he tries a check 
then it only delays things after rook f1. The queen's going to be evicted now. There's no support of the queen to exploit the back row. So for example, queen h5, rook f6, check again. Queen g6, and, and white's just absolutely winning, for example, like this. It's just winning the queen, it's end of game. So this is a bit of a masterpiece game from Tigram Trojan, and it ended Fisher's consecutive run of 20 games in a row in a spectacular fashion. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll be looking on this channel other games from this classic match with Trojan at the peak of Fisher's powers in 1971. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.